He was known as the King of Cocaine, the kingpin of the Medellin cartel, and the wealthiest criminal in history. By the time of his death, Pablo Escobar had amassed a wealth of $30 billion. He was the undisputed leader of organized drug trafficking in South America, and no one dared cross him. He ruled hundreds. He commanded an army of the most terrifying and notorious foot soldiers who eliminated maybe thousands on his orders. He lorded over an empire and lived an extravagant lifestyle that included luxurious mansions, private jets, fast cars, and women. He achieved all this by living dangerously. This is the savage life of Pablo Escobar. His was a rags to riches story. Pablo Escobar's life was a regular rags to riches story, although he chose the shortest route to riches, and that was through crime. Escobar was born on December 1, 1949, into a lower middle class family. The fact that he had grown up in the drug infested Medellin may have had a lot to do with Escobar turning to crime. As a teenager, he became a petty street criminal, stealing cars and money. Some say he also stole tombstones and sold them to crooked Panamanians. Early Life Escobar was born in Rio Negro, Colombia on December 1, 1949, into a lower middle class family and grew up in Medellin, Colombia. The fact that he grew up in the drug infested Medellin may have influenced him to turn to crime, which he did. As soon as he hit his teens, Escobar became a street criminal, stealing money in cars. His activities spread to selling illegal cigarettes and fake lottery tickets, which got him noticed by local drug lords, who took Escobar under their wing. Escobar's job was to kidnap people and hold them for ransom. Not satisfied with his earnings, he soon found his own way into the illegal drug trade. He knew that it would make him serious money, and he soon hit upon the novel idea of transporting illegal cocaine to the United States. By 1970, he began purchasing cocoa paste from Bolivia and Peru, had it refined and made ready for transportation. His drug trade grew into a flourishing business, with Escobar achieving his first milestone in 1975. Rise to Power When Fabio Restrepo, a local Medellin drug lord, was murdered, Escobar saw an opportunity and stepped in to fill the vacuum left by Restrepo. With his own gang, he instantly moved in and took over the dead drug lord's organization. In 1976, he established the infamous Medellin cartel with the main aim of cocaine distribution and establishing different safe routes into the United States. The network grew exponentially, fueled by the heavy demand for cocaine in the USA. By the 80s, Escobar was already shipping a phenomenal 80 tons of cocaine into the country, which made him one of the richest men in the world. His Marriage and Affairs It was during this year that Escobar met 15-year-old Maria Victoria Hanao Viejo, whom he married and had two children with, Juan Pablo and Manuela. The problem is when you're a drug lord with untold riches at your disposal, you want more than just a wife, and Escobar was no exception. He was known to have several girlfriends, and even had a number of extramarital affairs, and tended to prefer underage girls. Notable among his many girlfriends was Virginia Vallejo, who went on to become a famous Colombian television personality. Despite his flings and affairs, Escobar remained married to Maria Victoria until his death. Rich and Powerful It wasn't long before Escobar soon controlled all organized crime in Medellin, besides the illegal drug network. The rise to power was not easy, though, and involved several gang wars, gun battles with rival cartels, and the elimination of scores of his enemies that included judges, locals, infiltrators, police officers, and the opposition. By now, Escobar was responsible for almost 80% of cocaine transported into the United States, and by 1982, he became so powerful that he made political friends in high places. They supported Escobar's election to the Colombian Congress. Here was a drug lord taking part in running the country, and Colombians could not do a thing. If anyone dared object or oppose Escobar, they might have found themselves thrown into the ocean tied to a stone or with a bullet in their head. With economic criminal and political power, Escobar's rise was complete. A drug lord who served out bribes or bullets. Pablo Escobar's phenomenal rise as the undisputed leader of the Medellin cartel grew along with his reputation for being ruthless. Each time anyone opposed him, be it a political opponent or someone from an opposing cartel, he would dish out his brand of a terrifying action called plata o plomo. The words were enough to send shivers down any spine, because it meant silver or lead. You could either take a bribe or a bullet. There was no middle line or negotiation with Pablo Escobar. Moreover, if you double-crossed Pablo Escobar or opposed him, he wouldn't just take you out. He would first go after your family. He was as savage as that. 
It is still unknown how many men and women have been victims of one of the most ruthless drug lords in history, but the common assumption is that the figures run into the thousands. He cared nothing for social status. Pablo Escobar was so cold-blooded, he didn't even care for an opponent's social standing. It could be a minister, a judge, even a presidential candidate. It didn't matter to him. All that mattered was that an opponent needed to be eliminated. It was also rumored that Escobar was behind the 1985 attack on the Supreme Court, carried out by the 19th of April insurrectionist movement, in which several Supreme Court justices were killed. His infamous exploits also included blowing up a plane, Avianca Flight 203, which had 110 people on board. The attack was intended to eliminate a presidential candidate who wasn't even on board. Throughout his life, Escobar ordered several high-profile assassinations that included magistrates, journalists, policemen, and even criminals inside his own organization. Height of his power By the mid-80s, Pablo Escobar reached the pinnacle of his fame. He was one of the most powerful men in the world. Even Forbes voted him the world's seventh richest man. He had successfully and cold-bloodedly built up an empire of soldiers and criminals, ready to carry out his bidding at any moment, irrespective of the deed. He owned expensive mansions, luxury apartments, he even owned his own airstrips and airplanes. Heck, he even had his own private zoo. By now, it was assumed his wealth was worth around $24 billion. He was extremely powerful, and no one dared to lift a finger against him because they could be silenced anywhere, anytime. Escobar was as shrewd as he was notorious. He spent millions on the welfare of local folk in Medellin, building churches, parks, schools, stadiums and houses for the poorest of Medellin's inhabitants. His strategy was successful, and the people regarded him as a modern-day Robin Hood. He was their local blue-eyed boy, who had done well and was giving back to his community. Legal Troubles Escobar was the most powerful man in Colombia, and even the government feared him. It was literally impossible for the Colombian authorities to link or book him for any crime. He held them with a tight fist of bribe or bullets. All attempts to bring him to justice were stifled. Officials were bribed into keeping their mouths shut, while those who dared were neutralized. However, there was one entity who wasn't afraid of Escobar, the U.S. government. Escobar may have been a kingmaker and kingpin in Colombia, but for the USA, he was just another drug lord who needed to be brought to justice. By now, Escobar was well and truly under the scanner of the DEA, and they wanted him bad. The U.S. government began heavily pressuring the Colombian government to extradite Escobar, who used every trick in the book to avoid it. He sentenced himself to his own prison. In 1991, the Colombian government put forward a fantastic and weird scheme to the U.S. government that could be described as a bit harebrained. Escobar would surrender and accept a five-year jail term, but he would only do so in a prison that he would make. He would not be extradited to the U.S. That seemed a bit hilarious and one can imagine the sarcastic smirk on the face of the official who may have first read it. The so-called prison would be given the name La Catedral. It would be a virtual fortress that would include amenities like a jacuzzi, a waterfall, a full bar and a soccer field. He would also be guarded by his own guards, and one doesn't really know what to make of something like that, which sounds extremely absurd. As ridiculous as it sounds, the scheme was set into operation by the Colombians, and Escobar had the last laugh, running his empire from his five-star prison. Today, however, La Catedral is in ruins and is often explored by treasure hunters, all searching for the drug lord's loot. The Fall of Pablo Escobar In July 1992, Pablo Escobar went too far by ordering some of his opponents to be brought to La Catedral, where they were tortured and eliminated. This angered the Colombian government, who by now had had enough of Pablo Escobar. Getting wind of a plan to incarcerate him in a regular prison, Escobar went into hiding. Little did Escobar know, he had bitten off more than he could chew and was looking at his gradual decline. Colombia then cooperated with the U.S. government, who sent in their best DEA action teams to hunt down Escobar. By late 1992, Escobar was on the run from an elite Colombian task force trained by U.S. special forces. Gunning for Escobar was also Los Pepes, a shadowy organization of Escobar's enemies. This was an organization made up of family members of his victims and financed by Escobar's main business rival, the Cali Cartel. It seemed the ghosts of his past were now catching up with him. On December 2, 1993, Pablo Escobar was found by the Colombian task force, who used sophisticated U.S. technology to track him down. They attempted to bring him alive to be tried in the U.S., but knowing Escobar, the man wasn't going down without a fight. A Hollywood-style shootout ensued that resulted in Escobar being gunned down while trying to escape from the roof. The reign of the most powerful drug lord in South America had come to an end. 
it could safely be said, Escobar lived and died by the gun. The Decline of the Medellin Cartel With the death of Pablo Escobar, the Cali Cartel soon took over, but it too was shut down by the Colombian government, who now decided they had had enough of drug lords exploiting the nation. Pablo Escobar was remembered by many in different ways. To the locals of Medellin, he was remembered as a benefactor, and to those in the higher echelons of society, he was a drug lord, a mafia boss who was best six feet underground. Escobar's dramatic life inspired several movies, books, and TV series like Narcos and Escobar Paradise Lost. Pablo Escobar's life was fascinating, no doubt, but with him gone, it wasn't the end of South America's war on drugs. In Mexico, a new drug lord was climbing his own ladder to fame. Perhaps as notorious and bloodthirsty as Pablo Escobar, he was Joaquin Guzman, or El Chapo. But that you can see in another video, and all you need to do is subscribe to this channel.